Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith, and I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, your broadcast host for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Uh, the program is coordinated and organized by the folks at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Working together, we bring you this amazing program every Wednesday at noon, where we can meet some interesting people doing interesting things in the work of science, nature, education, even art. And today we've got another exciting program for you. As we go throughout the program, remember that the Lunchtime Discovery Series is interactive. So I want everybody who's willing to jump into the chat, whether you're watching on YouTube or the comment section on Facebook, even if it's just to say, hi, let us know where you're viewing the program from. But of course, as we go throughout the presentation, we wanna know your thoughts, your questions about today's topic. So make sure throughout the program that you're leaving those in the chat. For me, when we get to the end of the program, I'll be looking to all of you for the questions for today's guest speaker. So make sure you're queuing all those up for me. Don't make me have to ask all the questions myself. For the month of March, now we've been celebrating Women's History Month. And so all month long, the Lunchtime Discovery Series has been uh, a partnership also with the Department of Environmental Quality's Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. And so in recognition, we've been talking to amazing women who have done some pretty cool stuff in the worlds of science, nature, education, and beyond, telling great stories and sharing their expertise with us. And so today, everybody, I would love to introduce you to Grace DiCecco. Grace is a PhD candidate in evolution, ecology, and organismal biology at UNC Chapel Hill and joins me now. Hi, Grace. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Glad that you could be here. Uh, quick question, though. Where, because I'm always unsure of this when I do these introductions for our guest speakers, uh, there are all these different like categories for where people are at in their PhD programs. So uh, I had PhD candidate in your bio. Where does that put you in the process of getting your, your degree? Um, yeah, PhD, so PhD candidate means I'm towards the end of my degree. And actually, I did my defense a couple weeks ago. So I passed and I'm going to be graduating in May. Wow. Okay. Congratulations. Thanks. So, uh, so what? Uh, I could say very nearly Dr. DeCecco. Yeah, yeah, nearly. Is that ex <laughs> That's acceptable. Well, oh, uh, congratulations. Thanks. So, uh, well, let's get to the program. I'm excited to learn more about uh, your research on, on iNaturalist, a great platform for us nature lovers. Uh, I'll turn the show over to you. Okay. Let me get my presentation up. Okay. Everything look good? Looks great. Great. Um, so hi everybody, I'm Grace. Um, I'm a grad student at UNC and I'm going to be talking today about some research that I've done um, investigating how users use iNaturalist to record observations and how iNaturalist can be used for scientists who want to study biodiversity. So um, in case there's anyone on the call today who doesn't, hasn't heard of iNaturalist yet, it's a really cool platform which enables users and um, anyone who's interested to take pictures of wildlife or organisms they observe out in nature, uh, upload it to a website through an app or just through the website and share your observations with other people who are interested in studying biodiversity. So that other fellow naturalists, whether they're amateurs or professionals, um, and it provides a community where you can discuss the different um, species that you've seen, cool things in nature that are around you. Um, and so iNaturalist has observations submitted by users from all over the globe. So you can see this sort of screenshot from their website showing a map of where observations have been recorded um, all over land and sea. Um, and at, as of when I took this screenshot, there were over 91 million observations recorded on the platform of people uploading birds or plants or insects, any, any organisms that they've seen. And so iNaturalist can also help you to learn about different species in your area. So um, each species that is recorded on iNaturalist, they provide some natural history information about the species. 
Um, and they also have some tools to help you learn to identify species, such as um, they have this other app called Seek, which actually uses your phone camera to, in real time, um, help you identify species around you. And um, the platform can help you track a list of species that you've seen in your neighborhood or in all your travels, and also uh, connect you with an online community of naturalists who are all interested and excited about nature. And um, so in addition to being a really cool platform for participants to use, um, scientists are also really interested in the observations that you and other iNaturalist users upload because they can be used for research. And so um, I'm just gonna give a few examples of a, ton, a, a small sampling of sort of many, many different applications of iNaturalist research. Um, one thing that scientists can do is examine species distribution. So by looking at all of the observations of a species that have been recorded in the platform, they can estimate where does a species occur and what are the conditions which um, the species prefers or tolerates that would help describe its distribution. Um, another thing that scientists have done with iNaturalist data is track invasive species in real time. And so, for example, this um, ladybird beetle that is an invasive species in Argentina, scientists have been able to use iNaturalist observations to track how the species has expanded throughout the country over the past few years. Um, just an, another example is mapping color morphs. So when you take a picture of an organism, of course, the species identification is useful data, but also um, information contained within the picture. So for example, Eastern gray squirrels come in lots of different colors um, and you can see which color the squirrel is from the picture. And so scientists have used photographs uploaded to iNaturalist to map where different color morphs occur. So for example, black color morphs of Eastern gray squirrels, which um, occur across the upper Midwest, scientists have been able to map where those are based using iNaturalist observations. And so um, today I'm going to talk about two research projects that I've done. And the first one is focusing on um, the behavior of iNaturalist users using the platform and how the behavior of users on the platform will influence how scientists can use the data for all these different applications. And then um, the second part will focus on an application of iNaturalist data in my research, studying insect phenology, which is um, seasonal timing of life history events. And so I'll start with this first research project about iNaturalist users and how um, what we learn about how iNaturalist users use the platform can help scientists form uh, research questions appropriately. And so this is work that um, was done with some of my lab mates at UNC and also with some collaborators at the University of Florida. And um, so one of our research goals for this project was to look at spatial and temporal patterns in iNaturalist observations. So what are the places and landscapes that are most common for people to make observations in? For example, are observations coming from parks or coming from natural areas most, most of the time? And also um, the timing of when users are making the most observations sort of within a year, but also at a finer resolution. And then our second um, objective was to look at how observers are making their observations. So do users of the platform like to make repeat observations of the same species? Um, for example, are they recording every time they see a monarch in a given year, for example? And also, are users focusing or specializing on a particular taxonomic group? So is it likely that a user is um, sort of focused on just recording all of the observations of butterflies they see, or are users mostly recording a wide variety of things that they might encounter? And so our methodology for this was to collect all of the iNaturalist observations that had been made up to that point. And so that was several million observations. Um, and so what we did with those observations was um, each record in iNaturalist comes with lots of information that's useful for investigating how users are uploading observations and where they're making them. So um, each observation of course has the image and a, a species identification or sometimes at a higher level if species can't be um, identified. And then we also know the user login for each um, observation. So we can look at the patterns for users by their login. Um, and then we know the date and time that the observation is made and also the location. And so all of this information can be used by um, us to sort of piece together what, uh, what a, how a user is using the platform and then understand how 
those patterns might drive what scientists will do with the observations. So um, this first figure is showing a map of uh, countries in the world and each country is shaded in based on how many observations in the platform come from that country. And so you can see that in these sort of lighter greenish and yellow colors are the countries that have more observations and darker colors are fewer. Um, and what we found is that, so iNaturalist was started in the US. And so as you would expect, the US and North America has a really high um, number of observations relative to other places. Also Europe um, and Australia have high numbers of observations. And, um, and a pattern, another pattern we observed is that sort of in the, in the tropics, where there is tons of biodiversity, there's still relatively few observations on iNaturalist. And so how would this impact a researcher who wants to use iNaturalist data is that um, right now, this data set is really great for studying, studying species that have distributions in these areas where there's high densities of observations in North America and Europe, but it's still um, maybe more difficult to study species that occur in areas where we don't have as many observations. Um, we also plotted the growth in users and observations on the platform. And so here you can see the uh, time is on the x-axis and we have observations and users, observations in black and users in purple in units of millions of observations and millions of users. Um, and the platform started in 2008, but as you can see in the past, um, like, past decade or so, the platform has really exploded in growth. And so um, it, it's sort of on an exponential trajectory in terms in growth in users and observations, and we expect these patterns to continue into the future. Um, and so what this means for scientists is that um, there's sort of an uneven sampling effort through time in this platform because it's growing rapidly. So there is the in more recent years, there's lots of observations, um, but it's more difficult to measure changes over time and species right now. However, as the platform grows into the future, it'll become easier. Um, we also investigated where people are making ob iNaturalist observations and what sorts of landscapes. Um, and so this plot is showing the percentage of observations in North America that come from each of these different uh, land cover categories. And so, um, oh, let me go back a second, sorry. And so what we can see is these, these shaded in bars are showing the proportion of observations in iNaturalist that occur in each of these categories. And these black outlines are the expected percentage of observations we would expect to find in those land cover categories if iNaturalist users were randomly sampling their environment. So what you can see is some categories are underrepresented in iNaturalist. For example, shrub and grassland um, type ecosystems occur much more in the US than they do in the iNaturalist data set. Alternatively, um, developed area, which is human influenced, uh, is overrepresented in iNaturalist, which um, makes a lot of sense because people are taking pictures of things they see when they are um, when they're spending most of their time, you know, in developed environments. And so this ranges from open spaces like a city park, and high intensity is something like a strip mall where there's a lot of cement. And so you, what this uh, means for scientists is that when we are using iNaturalist data to study sort of maybe a species distribution or habitat preferences. Um, we need to account for this uneven sampling across different environments because we wouldn't want to mistakenly think that a species really um, is strongly prefers human induced environments because most of the observations are from there, but we need to adjust for the fact that um, a disproportionate number of observations come from those human influenced environments as opposed to more natural or grassland type environments. Um, and then we also investigated the seasonal timing of when people are making the most observations. And so this is a, a similar type of plot as we saw before, where the black line is showing the number of observations and the purple line is showing the number of users. And at this time, we're looking, this plot is showing um, within a year and in each week, how many observations and how many unique users are on the platform. And so what we see is these sort of hump shapes where um, in the times, especially in northern in the northern hemisphere, when the weather is good, people are making more observations because they're outside more and it's more uh, there's more things to look at, especially if you're thinking about bugs or things that only uh, that would come out more in the summer. And then we also see these two really dramatic spikes 
um, which are around April, which is during a time where iNaturalist has a program called the City Nature Challenge, which encourages um, users from different cities to compete and see how many observations they can make in that one weekend. And so um, what this means for scientists using the platform is that if you wanted to study how species are occurring throughout the annual cycle, you will want to account for the fact that um, there's higher sampling effort during these one these sort of special events like City Nature Challenge and also during summer. So if you're studying a species that is around all year, it's more likely to be observed by someone in iNaturalist in August than it is in March when the weather is worse. Um, and then we also looked at within a week, what day of the week were people most likely to be using the platform? And so in the black bars, we have the observations per day of the week. And in the purple bars, we have the users per day of the week. And so what we found is that um, more people are using iNaturalist on the weekend, which makes sense um, if a lot of people are working during the week. And then on the weekend is when they're going hiking or taking a walk around their neighborhood and can make observations. Um, and so what this means for um, applications of iNaturalist data for scientists is that um, you, when considering sort of temporal patterns in species occurrences using the platform, it's important to aggregate the observations to the level of one week, because if you are wanting to say something at sort of below one week at the level of a day, the observations are influenced by the sort of uneven sampling where a lot of the observations are coming from the weekend. So that just means that um, sort of the finest resolution you would want to think about temporal changes with these data is at the level of one week. Um, so we also investigated what uh, types of organisms people are most likely to observe. And so this is a, a figure from the iNaturalist team that's showing. So the, the total number of squares for each of this group is the number of species. So for example, insects are one of the most speciose groups on, on the planet and so, or the most speciose group. And so you can see only 11% um, or this small number of green squares are the percent of species that have been observed at iNaturalist. Whereas other groups like birds, where there's relatively fewer species of birds, um, almost all of them have been recorded in iNaturalist. So there is a little bit of a difference between taxonomic groups in what, um, what has been most observed in iNaturalist. Um, and so this plot is a, just a little bit of a different way to visualize that same information where on the x-axis we have um, classes and the number of species in that class. And then on the y-axis is the proportion of species in that class that are recorded in iNaturalist. And so we can see again, aves, which is birds, has um, almost all of the species ob observed, whereas insecta is all the way down on the lower right of this plot with tons of species and relatively few of them that have been recorded in iNaturalist. And so um, this will just influence what types of organisms scientists might use iNaturalist data to study. It, you wanna, or obviously you wanna pick a species that is well represented by the data. And so um, it might be more suitable to do, to focus on um, taxonomic groups that are more completely captured in the data set. Um, and so we also wanted to investigate sort of how users are using the platform. And so, for example, are users likely to make repeat observations of species? So if you see a monarch butterfly once, are you likely to record it the second time you see it as well in iNaturalist? And so to do that, we um, investigated the relationship between observations per user. So this is the total number of observations that a user has made on iNaturalist. And then on the y-axis is the number of species they've observed. And so if an observer is recording only the first time they see a species, so each observation is a new species, their, their black dot, where each black dot is a user, they will fall along this dark blue line. So basically for every one observation, you'll see one new species. And so um, the empirical relationship that we observed is shown in this light blue line. And so you can see when users, um, for users that haven't made too many observations on iNaturalist, fewer than 10, they really closely approach this one-to-one -one, um, ratio between observations and number of species. Whereas as um, users become more active on the, on the platform, so users that have made, for example, above a thousand observations, which is a ton, um, the light blue line starts to depart from this black line. And so those users are more likely to be, make, be recording multiple observations of the same species 
um, although still they're fairly close to this uh, one to one relationship. So they're likely to be um, mostly recording new species that they see. Um, and then, so these are histograms are just showing the distribution of users along these two axes. So you can see sort of the median um, user on a naturalist has made about 10 observations and observed about 10 species. And then there are a handful of, um, of users on the platform that have made tons of observations, like over a thousand, which is really impressive. Um, and then the second way that we investigated this question was looking at what proportion of all observations come from accounts that, have, that are of different activity levels. So for example, what proportion of observations come from accounts which have made one observation only on the platform versus 10 versus 100 versus um, 10,000. And so this curve is sort of accumulating the proportion of observations that have been observed, for example, by accounts that have made one observation up to 10, up to 100, up to um, 10,000. And so what you can see is that the top 1% of users by total number of observations provide about 62% of the observations that have been identified to species. And the top 10% of users in terms of activity level are providing almost 90% of the total observations. So observations that end up identified to species are coming disproportionately from users who are really active on the platform. And so um, what this, this data tells us about how scientists should use iNaturalist is that because um, observers are likely to uh, maybe be using this, using the platform more as a way to collect different species they've seen and not as likely to record repeat observations, um, it's hard to use iNaturalist observations to measure things like abundance of species because to do that, you would want um, sampling, which approaches more how a scientist will go out and sample where they record every single organism they see in a given time period or in a given place. Um, and in that way, you get repeat observations of species, which can enable you to examine sort of relative abundances. But um, a naturalist is better suited to questions that don't require that level of information. Um, and then our sort of our second investig part of this project was looking at how specialized observers are. So, for example, if we have two users on our naturalist who each made five observations, how are those observations uh, sort of distributed through the tree of life? For example, user one is what we would call maybe more of a generalist who is observing some birds, some insects, some reptiles, a little bit of everything. And the user on the bottom here, user two, is maybe you could consider a specialist who is only recording reptiles. And so maybe this person really loves reptiles and that's what they wanna focus their naturalist account on. And so we wanted to investigate what proportion of users fall into these different groups? What proportion are generalists and what proportion are specialists? And so when we look at the class level, um, we were able to group users into these sort of 10 different groups based on what taxonomic groups they're likely to observe. And so um, what this plot is showing is for each of these groups, what is the average proportion of observations that come from different classes? So for example, group one at the top is what we would think of as our generalist group. And so this is users who are observing insects, they're observing different plants in green, um, they're making observations of fungi in this pinkish color. Um, and then we have these other more specialized groups. So for example, group two is people who are really focused on plants. Um, we have a group that's really focused on birds, this light blue for aves. Um, there is a group really focused on fungi, for example, group four, Agaricomycetes is a fungal group. Um, and so then we looked at what proportion of users fall into each of these groups. And so, um, for example, in group one, just over 50% of users fell into this generalist group. And so that means about um, just under half of users would be classified as more specialist users who are focusing on a particular taxonomic group. Um, and we also investigated sort of how specialist the users are or generalist compared to our expectations for an average user. And so this dotted line at zero is sort of is our expectation for how specialized an average user could be on our naturalist. And then this distribution is showing how people fall relative to that average expectation. So if the density of, is, of, the, of this curve is mostly centered in negative numbers, that means users in that group are slightly more specialist than we would expect. And if it's 
on the positive side, that means it's a little more generalist than we would expect from the average account. And so you can see this group one is sort of is um, somewhat close to zero, um, where these people are only a little bit more specialized than you would expect on average. And then we have some, some groups with more substantial departures, for example, our plant focused group where this curve is, is centered in a much more negative value. So these users are a lot more specialist than we would expect. And that's about 30% of people who are focusing really just on plants with their iNaturalist accounts, for example. Um, and then as you can see, some of these later groups with these um, more, some of these later specialist groups have only a handful of accounts, but those people are really dedicated, for example, to only to making observations of only spiders in this group 10. Um, and then we also did this uh, sort of specialization grouping analysis for um, orders within the um, group Insecta. And so we had the same sort of um, goal of investigating whether users are mostly generalists or mostly specialists. Um, and so here we have the same sort of plot layout where the x-axis is the average proportion of observations that fall into each of these orders. Um, and then, and so for group one is again, our sort of generalist group. And this is, so these are observers that are observing lots of different types of insects, but um, even within this group, you can see there is still a little bit of a bias towards Lepidoptera, which are butterflies in this red color. Um, and then we have some other groups which are more specialized. For example, group two is, is a group that's really focused predominantly on Lepidoptera. The vast majority of their observations are of butterflies. We have, for example, group four, which is focused on Hymenoptera. That includes um, ants and bees, so some social insects. Um, and then what we, so we did the same sort of set of analysis where we we're looking at the proportion of users that fall into each of these different groups. And so in insects, we found that a little more than when we were looking at all taxonomic groups, about 60% of users are considered generalists by our grouping. And so you can see in the same sort of layout where this dotted line is our average expectation for how specialized the user might be, most of these users are in positive values. So they're a little more generalized in making observations across a lot of different types of groups than we would expect. And then we have some um, sort of really specialized groups. For example, our, our group two Lepidoptera, about a third of users are focused predominantly on butterflies and moths. And those users are more specialized than we would expect based on sort of the average user. So they're really focusing in on that one taxonomic group. And so these results are really interesting because they help us um, think about if you have a if you have a study question, perhaps if you are someone who, if you are studying Lepidoptera, maybe you want to focus in on users who fall into this really specialist group because you might, um, because you know that they'll be really focused on observing all of the different types of butterflies in their environment, for example. So the, these observations might be useful for scientists to think about which sort of group of users you want to pull your um, study pool from. And so, um, just to sort of wrap up the general uh, takeaways that we had from this study about how we, our results about how users use the platform, how that will impact how researchers will um, use iNaturalist observations and studies. And so one important feature is that um, scientists will need to account for this uneven distribution of observations in space and time. So people are making observations when it's convenient for them. And so that will mean that for example, many observations are coming from the weekend versus weekdays, and also many observations are coming from more human-influenced habitats than um, natural ones. And so that's just something that scientists will need to account for when they're doing studies. It doesn't mean the data isn't useful, but it just requires an extra step or two to account for those um, biases. And then um, it's also really important for scientists to think about which organisms are most likely to be um, first of all, observed in the platform at all, and second of all, reach an identification level that's uh, suitable for scientific research. So for, first of all, people, there's going to be a bias in what organisms are easy to photograph. That's an, one uh, feature. So if it's something that you can't ever really get very close to um, or won't stay still for a photograph, like a really fast moving fly, it's probably less likely to make it into iNaturalist in the first place. Um, and then what gets identified, some, some species are more easily identifiable on, based on photographs than others. For example, a bird, if you see a picture of a blue jay, most of the time you can be pretty confident that it's a blue jay. 
Um, however, some groups like fungi are um, difficult or even impossible to identify from a photograph alone, and you need more information about the organism. So those study organisms may not be as good of a choice to use iNaturalist data for because we can have less confidence in the identification. So um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit now, and I'm going to talk about an application of iNaturalist data in my research, which is investigating insect phenology, the seasonal timing of um, insect occurrence and abundance. And so um, phenology, right, is the seasonal timing of events in, um, in life histories of organisms. And so for um, insects, in particular caterpillars, which is a group I'm really interested in, um, we are interested in tracking sort of the number of individuals that are occurring throughout an, an annual cycle. And so you can see this data is actually straight from my naturalist. It's a curve of the naturalist observations of a particular caterpillar. And you can see this caterpillar sort of peaks in the number of observations in July, and there's fewer in March and April, for example, when, um, when the caterpillars are emerging. And so insects in particular are important to study the phenology of because they play this sort of intermediate role within different trophic levels. So insects are a really important um, population for herbivory of vegetation. So um, caterpillars are munching on leaves in forests and in open areas as soon as they start emerging. Um, and then caterpillars are also an important food source themselves for other organisms, in particular um, breeding birds really rely on caterpillars um, for feeding their young during the spring in North America. And so um, studying the seasonal timing of insects, they, because they're in this middle world, they can sort of be influenced from below and above, and they also have influences on sort of plants, but also on birds. And so what um, we're interested in doing is using our naturalist to see if we can measure changes in this um, seasonal timing of when insects are most likely to be out and whether this timing is coming earlier or later. And so one expectation from climate change that we might have where springs are getting warmer, particularly in the Eastern US is that insects may start emerging earlier. And if these caterpillars, if this curve is all sort of shifted earlier into the season, um, perhaps there will be mismatches with when birds are arriving and trying to feed their young with caterpillars, and also when, um, when trees are leafing out. And so um, what we did was try to use iNaturalist observations to measure phenology, right? And so that curve that I've been showing is, comes from iNaturalist, and so there's variability within the year of when um, the most numbers of, um, of different insect species are observed. And so what we used in particular was this um, iNaturalist project that pulls all caterpillar pictures called um, Caterpillars of Eastern North America. And what we did with those data was compare them to some structured surveys that were designed to monitor caterpillar abundance and changes over time. And so we have these unstructured surveys from iNaturalist, unstructured just meaning that um, there's people are just making observations when they want. There's no set time or set number of observations they need to make in a given time window, for example. Whereas our structured surveys come from this project called Caterpillars Count, which has a very uh, defined method of sampling where you return to the same branch uh, every week and you count all of the caterpillars that you see on that branch um, at the same time. And so this is a very a highly structured way of making observations because we're returning to the same location at a set time interval. And so what we wanted to do was examine estimates of phenology from these structured surveys with unstructured surveys from iNaturalist. And that's because structured surveys are very difficult to do. They take a lot of time and effort. And so we can only have this data at a limited geographic area. And so if we want to study patterns at broad spatial scales, it would be great if we could use unstructured observations because as we have just seen, there's tons of iNaturalist observations across a really big geographic area. And so um, one way that we compared these data was just in what types of species are in each of these data sets. And so um, our structured surveys, caterpillars count is this bar on the left and iNaturalist is on the right. And so these bars are shaded by the proportion of observations that come from these different families within Lepidoptera. And so you can see, for example, that this dark blue geometridae is really a big proportion of observations in caterpillars count. 
Um, whereas the, this, these orange groups, Nymphalidae and Papulonidae, are really small in caterpillars count, but very large in naturalists. And that um, has something to do with the fact that these surveys are structured versus unstructured. So for this dark blue group, Geometridae, these are sort of what you would think of maybe as an inchworm. They tend to be just solid green or brown. They're fairly small on average, and they are they tend to be sort of camouflaged and not very interesting to look at maybe. And so um, it makes sense that when you're looking for caterpillars like we do in caterpillars count in our structured surveys we find a lot of these guys but if you're just uh, sort of not looking specifically for caterpillars but just on a walk around you might not notice these guys that are hidden in the leaves whereas um, something like papillonidae these caterpillars tend to be really showy and colorful and cool to look at and so um, Perhaps users in iNaturalist are more likely to photograph these guys because they're easier to notice. And also, if you notice one, you want to maybe take a picture of it and remember that you saw such a cool caterpillar. So that's sort of one difference that we need to think about when um, trying to compare phenology between these two different data sets. Um, we also did a similar uh, analysis, as I showed before, about the whole iNaturalist data set, comparing the different types of land cover, where these observations come from. And so again, we have sort of caterpillars count, structured surveys, and iNaturalists on the right. Um, and what we found is that um, caterpillars count, while there still are observations that come from these more developed categories, um, we're missing this high intensity group, which is, um, like I said before, it's like strip malls, things with a lot of cement and impervious surfaces, which are observations from there represented in iNaturalists, but not in our structured surveys. And our structured surveys also focus more on forests, these uh, green colors than iNaturalist does. And so again, that's something that might impact phenology in different ways because we're observing caterpillars in a different sort of spatial location in caterpillars count versus iNaturalist. Um, and so what one way that we compared these was looking at um, in space, where are the most caterpillars observed? And so, this is, we looked at Eastern North America and we aggregated observations to these um, shapes that are called hex cells, but basically we're just aggregating all of the iNaturalist or structured survey observations that fall in these, in these cells. And so you can see here in darker colors are places where there are more caterpillars observed and in lighter colors are fewer. Um, and so here's the same figure showing our data for caterpillars count. And so you can see immediately, we don't have as many, nearly as many uh, hex cells with data in them because this data is much more difficult to obtain. And so that's part of our motivation is, okay, if we're getting the same sort of biological signal from caterpillars count as iNaturalist, then we can study a much larger area using iNaturalist data. And so what we found comparing these two, and so the values of the caterpillars count cells for how many caterpillars are there on the, are on the y-axis here, and the x-axis is the iNaturalist observations, you can see there's a pretty strong positive correlation between these two. So areas where a lot of caterpillars were observed in caterpillars count are also likely to be areas where a lot of um, caterpillars were observed in iNaturalist. So that's a good sign that so far, so far so good. There's a good correspondence between the patterns in these data sets. Um, and then we looked at measurements of phenology, so measurements of timing. Um, and so we used two measurements in this study. And so one is the peak date, which is just the day of the year where the most caterpillars were observed. And so wherever this curve is the highest. Um, and so that might be in June and it might be in July in the next year. Um, and then we also measured centroid date, which is sort of a weighted average of the whole curve based on the number of observations of caterpillars per day. And so the peak date is telling us sort of about a snapshot in time of when the most caterpillars are out. And the centroid date is giving us an average of the whole curve. So where, where is there more, relatively more caterpillars weighted earlier versus later in the season? And so we compare these two measurements between the different data sets. And so, um, so on the first panel here is a map showing peak date in iNaturalist. And so you can see darker colors are later peaks with the highest number of caterpillars. And then on the, the right side is the peak date for caterpillars count, where again, darker colors are the later day, peak days. And we made the same sort of plot where we're comparing the day of the peak in iNaturalist versus the day of the peak in caterpillars count. 
if they're if these are perfectly corresponding, they'll fall on this dotted line that says one to one. Um, and so we found that there is a positive correlation between these two, but it's not a perfect correlation, of course. Um, and then we did the same thing with centroid date, which is this weighted average of the whole curve instead of a snapshot of one point in time. And so the centroid date, um, it's the same sort of color scheme where darker colors are later in the season of the centroid. Um, and we have that for iNaturalist and caterpillars count. And we found a, a stronger correlation in centroid date between these two data sets. So when we consider the whole curve, um, we get a closer image of the same sort of phenology patterns in the two data sets than when we consider just a snapshot of when is the, what's the single day with the most caterpillars. And so um, what we concluded from this was that um, there were similar spatial patterns in where most caterpillars are observed. So that's good. Um, we, can, we can consider these data sets as good proxies for one another in terms of spatial patterns. Um, and then we found that the strongest correlations were in centroid date, which is considering the whole season of caterpillar um, occurrences, and the weaker correlation in peak date. And that's likely because peak date is more susceptible to a particular species having like a big outbreak. And so if one species is having an outbreak in a given year, it's really going to influence the peak date. And because we know that there's some differences in the species composition of these two data sets, um, if we think back to those sort of boring green caterpillars versus the cool colorful ones, um, it makes sense that this data, this peak date measurement is not as consistent between the two data sets, but that centroid date, which is considering um, the whole season and all the species may be more reliable in comparing the two. And so um, ultimately our results were reassuring that if, as long as we pick the right measurement of phenology, we can use iNaturalist as a proxy for our more um, sort of like time at intensive structured surveys so that we can study phenology at a broad spatial scale instead of only at a few locations. Um, so I just want to reemphasize that iNaturalist observations are really, really useful for scientific researchers. And not only is it a cool platform for um, everyone to get involved in, but it, the observations really do help us learn new things and make scientific advances. Um, I only talked about a few examples here, but there are, th there are literally thousands of, of scientific studies that use iNaturalist data. And so there are tons of examples and tons of cool work that's coming out of, of the platform that's supported by um, members of the public who are making observations in their free time, which is amazing. And I want to encourage everyone who is listening, if you are not already using iNaturalist, to try it out. It's really a fun platform. You can make an account online. You can use, there's a Seek app or the iNaturalist app itself. And the next time you're on a walk in your neighborhood, take a picture of something cool that you see. Um, and if you want to do the City Nature Challenge, which is that um, big dramatic spike in April of observations that I showed on this plot before, it's coming up in uh, at the end of April. And so, and the Triangle area is a, is a group which is competing in the City Nature Challenge. So you can make your observations be part of that if you are interested. And um, yeah, I wanna thank everyone for your attention and I'm really happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, everybody, let's give Grace a great big round of applause wherever you happen to be. Or you can drop little clapping hands emojis into the chat box. That works too. Uh, Grace, amazing presentation. Like I'm, I'm kind of floored by all of the different ways that researchers can and have used iNaturalist. But uh, just the... Uh, what would be a great way to put it? Like the diversity of things that they need to think about when they're going to use these observations in order to really get good knowledge out of all of this data. Like, mm -hmm. That's really impressive. Um, which it kind of makes me curious, I guess maybe I'll get the first question and then uh, folks, make sure you're typing up your questions. I'm coming to you folks in just a moment for your cues to get some answers. Um, do you see research studies that are, that are great studies, but that maybe they make a couple of assumptions using iNaturalist data that you feel like could be tweaked or improved uh, with, with the research that you've done here? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think in general, scientists are always trying to do the best that they can and to create the most reliable research that they can. Um, but I do think that there has been, because there's so much data in iNaturalist, there's been a temptation to try to uh, apply it to questions about sort of um, maybe relative abundances of different species or changes over time where the data are not quite there yet. And so, um, but in general, I think, um, of the, a lot of like studies using a naturalist are really reliable because scientists are thinking about these things and um, and discussing sort of what is the best way to use the data from the platform in a way that will enable us to get reliable results that are really telling us something new about about nature. That's great, great stuff. And you know, it made me your presentation made me think about like the way that I use iNaturalist. And I was trying to find myself in some of your plots, like, okay, how many observations have I submitted? So where does that mean I'm at proportionally to, to the other users? But then also thinking about the way that I use the platform and have submitted observations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I even, I took a second to like open my app and scroll through there for a minute. And uh, I was like, oh yeah, there's lots of brightly colored butterflies and caterpillars and spring wildflowers in here. And and also maybe just because I wanted to use the uh, artificial intelligence species suggestions to try to guess at these things. And then the bonus is I can submit them for, uh, you know, for research purposes into the platform. So I, I don't know. I might have to rethink how I use iNaturalist. I don't know. Is that a takeaway from from your research? Maybe we should be <laughs> teaching people to use iNaturalist better. I mean, I think I think that it's not necessarily a bad way to use it. And I do that, too, where I see something cool and I definitely want to take a picture of it. I think it's just um, it's just something to think about when you're crafting a study using iNatural data is to remember that, you know, people who are using the platform are going to have these same same thought processes that I would have, too, where I'm like, oh, this is a really cool caterpillar that I haven't seen before. This is the one I want to take a picture of versus the green inchworm that I've seen tons of. And so I, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think um, if you wanna maybe contribute to expanding the list of total species that are in iNaturalist, taking a picture of something that maybe looks a little less exciting or is unusual, that would, um, you could certainly make that a goal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cause I, uh, one, of the, one of the questions that came in, one of the, questions early in our presentation here from Ron. Uh, Ron's out in Las Vegas. Thanks for joining us. But wrote that, I'm. Uh, here's what they said. I'm particularly keen on connecting biodiversity and tourism, how to use these apps, Seek and iNaturalist, to learn about wildlife. And coming at that Seek has been a big help identifying trees, which makes me wonder, right? Uh, and there are a lot of environmental education folks who tune into this program too. Like, could those of us who want to use these tools and introduce them to the broader public, are the ways that we should be talking about iNaturalist to encourage people to take more pictures of the little green inchworms or the plants that they walk by that aren't uh, maybe as showy in order to improve the, the research data set with iNaturalist? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I think that also first, I want to say sorry if you can hear my cat meowing in the background. <laughs> um, but uh, that's but the yes. best part of these things. <laughs> yeah, work from home. Um, but Guest presenters. <laughs> So I think that um, one, I, I definitely think, for example, for the research that I do, it, I really do care about those little green caterpillars because those are the caterpillars that are eaten by birds mostly. Um, and so I think if, depending on the research question, that is something that um, could improve the data set, for example. I think it, it sort of depends right on what, what the research is doing because there's such a diversity of scientists using the platform. So some people maybe are really just interested in monarchs, which there are tons of observations of and people love to take pictures of. Um, so I think that it, I think it just sort of depends on what, um, it just depends on what your goal is for using the platform as well, because I mean, uh, none of this research could exist without uh, users who are committed to the platform. And so for me, I feel like any, any way of using it that makes people more excited about it is a good one. So. <laughs> That's an excellent point. Absolutely. We, we just need data. Give us all your data. 
All right, let's see. The next question in the chat here comes from Jeff. Since many INAT locations are obscured, did they exclude those species when examining the places these species were using? Yes, yeah. So, right, that is a setting that you can use is to um, obscure your location on a, of the observation on a naturalist, and then we wouldn't be using those observations in our study of, of examining where observations are located, yeah, which make, totally makes sense as a, as a privacy thing. If you are always posting the route that you're walking in the morning or whatever, that you don't want that to be online. <laughs> Yeah, all of the moths that come to the lights on my front porch, they get a they get a lot of iNaturalist observations <laughs> from from my lights at night. All right. Next one, Cindy writes, are you only looking at research grade observations? Although iNaturalist gets a lot correct, there are still many misidentifications. Yes. So there definitely are. And um for some applications, we did only look at research grade observations. So things where we wanted to make sure that where we want to investigate species level identifications there, we just look at research grade. Um, for other questions, for example, for that insect phenology work there, we're just interested in anything that is a caterpillar. And so um, we didn't necessarily restrict to um, research grade because we, we wanted things that are sort of in all of Lepidoptera. And so at that level, um, things are mostly pretty accurate about is this a caterpillar or is it not because that's sort of a course level question, but there definitely is disagreement and some inaccuracies when especially at the sort of finer level species level identifications and so that's something that um, that's just really important for scientists to keep in mind when they're considering their um, the, how to use the data in their studies. Great stuff. Okay, let's see here. Uh, the next one I have for you comes from John. How many structured projects did you find using iNaturalist for data collection? There are projects using it. Yeah, so there are a lot of these um, projects on iNaturalist. I don't know the exact number. Um, I have certainly used the Caterpillars of Eastern North America project, which is focused on just Lepidopter observations, separating um, adult moths and butterflies from caterpillar life stages. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how many there are. I imagine, but there's a lot. There's if, there, if there's something you're interested in, you can probably find a project that's focused on that. Do you know offhand how many iNaturalist observations you've submitted? Me personally? Um, so I submit a lot through, we have an account for Caterpillar's Count where, for that um, structured project. And so I'm sure I've submitted several hundred after it four summers of uh, photographing every caterpillar I see. And we use iNaturalist then not only as a source of data for our research project, but as a place to store data as well. So we were, all the observations that we make end up in iNaturalist to also contribute data for other scientists who might want to use it. Okay, answer hundreds and hundreds. I have mine, I work for a naturalist museum. It should probably be more, but it's, I'm, I'm getting close to 200 observations getting I'm, I'm approaching i probably shouldn't have admitted that to a whole audience full of like nature nerds that i only have 200 i naturalist observations i don't know especially with the city nature challenge uh, challenge coming up i should take the opportunity and really improve my rankings <laughs> so uh as we, as we near the end of our time, I should probably remind everybody who's watching, uh, if you are anywhere in the triangle, uh, we do compete in the City Nature Challenge. In fact, we drew a huge map around the triangle. So go just about anywhere, triangle and greater triangle, and uh, help us be the best. We've gotten close several years, the triangle area has, in being in like the top five. I think we were in like the top 10, top 15, out of 90 or 100 cities that participate or places that participate, it's pretty impressive. Which of course, if you know, we've got people like Grace submitting hundreds of caterpillars at a time, then, then we ought to be doing great. <laughs> Grace, thanks so much for being here. This was uh, really exciting stuff, really interesting to learn about some of the work that you've done uh, and the insights that you shared. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was really great to be here. And thanks everyone for your really great questions. Folks, viewers, 
We will be back here again next Wednesday with another Lunchtime Discovery Series presentation celebrating Women's History Month. We'll be here with Stacy Zhang, Dr. Stacy Zhang from the UNC Institute of Marine Sciences. So make sure that you check out naturalsciences.org. Look at the calendar of events to get information and details on the upcoming program, as well as the link to participate. You can also just subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel right here, where we'll be live again with another program or on our Facebook page as well. Uh, you can also get updates about everything happening here with the museum and the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education through our social media platforms. The museum is at Natural Sciences and the Office of Environmental Education is at North Carolina EE. Go follow them. They talk about really cool stuff all the time. Great account. And you can always find out new cool nature things happening all around North Carolina. So great resources there available for you. Grace, uh, congratulations on your PhD one more time. And thanks for being with us and sharing your research with us. Thank you. Everybody take care, stay safe. We'll see you again next week. Bye everybody.